Nine historic Japanese motorcycle engines changed everything. The most revolutionary engine on this list wasn't designed to be fast. It was built to replace the bicycle and became the most produced motor vehicle in human history, selling over 110 million units. Number 9. Honda Super Cub C100 C50 OHC Single, 1958. Here's where it all started, and most people completely underestimate this one. The Honda Super Cub's 50cc overhead cam horizontal single doesn't look like much, producing just 4.5 horsepower, but this was the first mass-market motorcycle engine designed for people who hated motorcycles. In 1958, motorcycles were loud, oil-dripping, kick-starting nightmares. Soishiro Honda asked a question nobody else was asking. What if we made a motorcycle? cycle so clean and foolproof that anyone could ride it in work clothes. The overhead cam single was ridiculously over-engineered for its displacement, featuring four-stroke refinement when cheaper two-strokes dominated. That OHC design meant smoother operation, better fuel efficiency, and crucially, it didn't smoke. Honda paired it with a three-speed semi-automatic transmission for nervous first-timers. Over 110 million Super Cubs sold, making it the best-selling motor vehicle in history. It mobilized populations across Asia, Africa, and developing markets. The Cub created riders out of non-riders. The thing is almost too bulletproof. Owners neglect maintenance because it keeps running until suddenly it doesn't. Check valve clearances every 4,000 miles religiously because that overhead cam design needs proper adjustment. Numerical score, 8 out of 10 for pure impact. It didn't redefine performance, but it redefined who could be a motorcyclist. Let's hit pause for a second. Before we continue, if you're getting value from this deep dive into Japanese engineering, do me a solid and subscribe to the channel. We're building a community of riders who actually care about the mechanical stories behind the legends. All right, let's keep rolling. Honda GL1000, GL1100, Goldwing Flat 4, 1975. Before 1975, long-distance touring meant you were masochistic or British. You'd spend eight hours on a vibrating parallel twin, arrive with numb hands and an aching back. The touring category barely existed because bikes were fundamentally compromised. Honda's answer was audacious. A water-cooled, flat-four engine producing smooth, turbine-like power with almost zero vibration. That 999cc mill made 80 horsepower, but could sustain 75 miles per hour all day carrying two people and luggage in comfort. The flat configuration kept the center of gravity low. Shaft drive meant no chain maintenance. Liquid cooling meant consistent temperatures even in Death Valley heat. Suddenly, touring was about enjoyment. The Goldwing created the long-distance comfort cruiser, who racked up 50,000 miles easily. Honda over-engineered the GL1000 so dramatically that many examples still run strong with 200,000 plus miles. That flat four layout makes valve adjustments genuinely painful though, requiring significant disassembly. The coolant system is your lifeline. Flush and replace coolant every two years without fail. Because when a GL1000 overheats, you're looking at warped heads and a blown budget. Numerical score, 7.5 out of 10. It invented a category, but didn't set performance benchmarks. Number 7. Kawasaki H2 Mach 4 750 Two-Stroke Triple, 1972. The Kawasaki H2 Mach 4 made insurance companies ask uncomfortable questions. This 750cc two-stroke triple made 74 horsepower with power delivery that can only be described as homicidal. The front wheel would paw to sky if you cracked the throttle aggressively in second gear. In 1972, Kawasaki needed headlines. Honda had the refined CB750, but refined didn't sell magazines. Kawasaki's engineers added another cylinder to their two-stroke twins and tuned it for unhinged speed. The result was a triple running three separate carburetors, producing a banshee wail announcing your arrival three blocks ahead. Two-stroke configuration meant serious power-to-weight advantages, but also mixing oil with gas and leaving blue haze like a crop 
Crop Duster. Magazine covers screamed, Widowmaker, and sales skyrocketed. The H2 set quarter mile records and sold the romance of speed to a generation raised on muscle cars. What gets glossed over is frame flex making high speed stability interesting, combined with marginal brakes and a chassis designed before anyone prioritized rigidity, you get a bike demanding serious respect. Emissions regulations killed the big two-stroke by the late 70s. If you own an H2, synchronize those three carbs religiously. When out of sync, the bike runs terribly and fouls plugs constantly. Numerical score? 7 out of 10. Cultural impact was massive, but engineering was brute force over elegance. Number 6. Suzuki GSX R750 Sax Oil-Cooled Inline 4, 1985. The Suzuki GSX R750 arrived in 1985 and made every other sport bike look compromised. This was a philosophy transplant from racetrack to street. Suzuki took their endurance racing program and asked what's the bare minimum for street legality. The answer was the Saks oil-cooled inline four, a 749cc screamer making 100 horsepower while keeping weight under 440 pounds. The oil cooling system used high volume oil flow through design passages in the cylinder head and barrel, providing better thermal management than air cooling without liquid cooling's weight penalty. This meant the engine could run tighter tolerances and higher compression than any air-cooled motor while staying lighter than water-cooled competitors. The aluminum frame was both lighter and stiffer than anything in the class. The GSX-R invented the modern sports bike category. Before the Gixxer, sports bikes were modified standards or detuned race replicas. After the GSX-R, every manufacturer needed a lightweight, high-revving, fully committed sport bike. The power-to-weight arms race started here. The original GSX R750 was unrefined though. Harsh suspension, cramped ergonomics, narrow power band requiring constant gear swapping. But it was faster than everything when ridden hard. That oil-cooled system worked brilliantly at speed, but cooked your legs in traffic. Oil serves double duty as lubricant and coolant, so changes every 2,000 miles are non-negotiable. Numerical score? 8.5 out of 10 for permanently altering sports bike DNA. Number 5. Honda CB750 4 Transverse SOHC Inline 4, 1969. The Honda CB754 deserves its own documentary. When it debuted at the 1969 Tokyo Motor Show, it moved the bar to a different zip code. Triumph, BCA, and Norton dominated with 650cc parallel twins that vibrated like paint shakers and leaked oil like a design feature. Honda's engineers said, What if we give them everything they're not expecting? The CB750's 736cc inline 4 was was accessible sophistication. Single overhead cam, four carburetors, electric start, and a front disc brake when everyone else used drums. It made 67 horsepower delivered with smoothness, making British twins feel agricultural. The motor loved to rev. Handling was predictable, and it started every time without leaving puddles. The CB750 invented the superbike category single-handedly, establishing the transverse inline 4 as the default configuration for five decades. British manufacturers scrambled, but the market had moved on. Early CB750 engines had cam chain tensioner issues that could grenade motors. Honda fixed it later, but early adopters learned preventative maintenance the hard way. The the cam chain tensioner needs inspection every 10,000 miles. Listen for excessive rattle on cold starts before catastrophic failure. Numerical score? 9 out of 10 for transforming motorcycling forever. Quick time out. We're halfway through, and I want to know, which of these engines have you actually ridden? Drop a comment below with your experience, because I love hearing stories from people who've actually twisted the throttle on these legends. And if you haven't subscribed yet, this is your moment. We're just getting to the really good stuff. Number 4. Kawasaki Z1 900 DOHC 903cc inline 4, 1972. 
three years after Honda's CB750, Kawasaki said, That's cute, hold my sake. The Z1900 arrived in late 1972, taking Honda's formula and turning everything up to 11. The result was a 903cc double overhead cam in line 4 making 82 horsepower, the fastest production motorcycle available. Honda defined the superbike, but Kawasaki wanted to own it. The move was simple. Add displacement, add another camshaft for better breathing, and engineer everything to withstand the stress. The DOHC setup allowed four valves per cylinder with aggressive cam profiles, meaning the Z1 breathed dramatically better. The motor was deliberately understressed, maintaining strong durability despite climbing power. Kawasaki added style with its iconic teardrop tank and four into four exhaust. Suddenly, every manufacturer needed more displacement and camshafts. The Z1 established Kawasaki as performance king, a reputation they've leveraged since. It proved bigger was better when done right, with mid-range torque making it more usable than pickier Honda. The dirty secret is the Z1's handling was sketchy when pushed hard. The frame couldn't quite handle the motor's output with period tires, and high-speed stability got exciting. Later models improved this, but early Z1s earned their straight-line bruiser reputation. Valve adjustments need attention every 4,000 miles with quality shims. Numerical score, 8.5 out of 10 for dramatically raising the performance ceiling. Number 3. Kawasaki GPZ 900R Ninja 900, 1984 the Kawasaki GPC 900R arrived in 1984 looking like it time traveled from the future. This wasn't just another inline four sport bike. It was complete rethinking of engine packaging for maximum efficiency. By the mid 80s, superbikes had gotten powerful but also bulky, heavy, and generated enough heat to cook your thighs. Liquid cooled bikes existed but had radiators creating aerodynamic drag and adding weight. Kawasaki's solution was radical. They designed a 16-valve 908cc inline-4 with compact liquid cooling where the radiator tucked up front, hidden by bodywork. The entire motor mounted in a lightweight diamond pattern frame both stiffer and lighter than previous designs. The result was 115 horsepower at just 515 pounds wet. Genuine featherweight for that power output. The engineering brilliance was vertical stacking rather than horizontal spreading. The transmission sat beneath the crankshaft. The alternator and ignition were miniaturized. Every component scrutinized for weight savings. This created an incredibly narrow profile slipping through air like a blade. The GPC 900R became the template for every modern sport bike. Compact, liquid-cooled, fully fared with serious power and a manageable package. It starred in Top Gun and cemented Ninja as synonymous with performance. First gen motors were high strung though, needing premium fuel and hating low RPM lugging. Coolant system is everything, so use specified coolant mix. Check hoses religiously and replace coolant every two years. Numerical score, nine out of 10 for creating the modern superbike template. Number 2. Honda VFR RC30 Gear Driven Cam V4 Late 1980s the Honda V4 story is about obsession and perfection and refusing to compromise. In the late 80s, Honda had proven they could build reliable 4s outperforming the competition, but they wanted something more exotic, something that'd be running perfectly when everything else had worn out. The VFR series and legendary RC30 represented Honda's answer. The goal was precision and longevity at sustained high RPM under racing conditions. Chain-driven cams stretch over time. Belt-driven cams can't handle extreme loads. Honda's solution was engineering jewelry. 
gear-driven double overhead cams on a 90-degree V4 configuration. Those gears meant zero timing chain stretch or belt degradation, maintaining perfect cam timing indefinitely. The V4 configuration provided perfect primary balance, meaning butter smooth operation at any RPM. The RC30's 748cc version made 118 horsepower, but delivery mattered most. Linear, predictable, accompanied by mechanical gear whines sounding like a Formula One race car. The VFR became the sport touring benchmark for decades. Owners regularly reported 100,000 miles with basic maintenance. Motors feeling tight even with massive mileage. The RC30 won World Superbike Championships. The controversial take is the V4 was over-engineered to the point of being uneconomical to manufacture. Valve adjustment complexity is real, requiring significant disassembly. Synthetic oil every 3,000 miles is mandatory because those gears depend on perfect lubrication. Numerical score, nine and a half out of 10 for engineering perfection. Number one, Suzuki Hayabusa GSX 1300R 1299 CC in line four, 1999. The Hayabusa launched the bar into orbit then chased it at 194 miles per hour. When Suzuki dropped this beast in 1999, they fundamentally altered what motorcycles could be. Heading into the millennium, the top speed crown was being passed around, but nobody had built a bike sustaining extreme velocity while remaining stable and usable. Previous contenders were track-focused missiles, terrifying mortals, or straight-line dragsters with sketchy handling. Suzuki's approach was holistic engineering. They built a 1299cc inline four, making 173 horsepower, paired with aerodynamics that would impress aerospace engineers. That distinctive bulbous bodywork was carefully shaped wind tunnel development, minimizing lift and drag while managing airflow around the rider. The motor was a masterclass in understressed durability. Suzuki deliberately over-engineered everything using thick cylinder walls, massive bearings, conservative rod ratios. The Hayabusa motor was practically bulletproof with examples exceeding 100,000 miles, handling forced induction when tuners got involved. The combination of displacement, smooth power delivery, and comfortable ergonomics created something unprecedented, a hyperbike you could ride cross-country in comfort. The Hayabusa topped 194 miles per hour, triggering the European agreement limiting bikes to 186 miles per hour. It created a subculture of land speed racing, with modified Hayabusas exceeding 250 miles per hour. At 545 pounds wet, parking lot maneuvers require attention. Valve checks come every 15,000 miles, but these understressed motors rarely need adjustment. Drive chain maintenance every 500 miles is the real priority. Numerical score, 10 out of 10 for defining a new performance era. Nine engines that rewrote motorcycle history improved Japanese engineering was definitive. From the Super Cub that mobilized billions to the Hayabusa that forced a gentleman's agreement, each solved problems while creating new benchmarks. Japanese manufacturers didn't just copy. They identified fundamental issues and engineered solutions that made the old guard irrelevant. These engines transformed who could ride, where they could ride, and how fast. They forced British manufacturers out, made a Italian exotics impractical and established Japan as the innovation center for generations. Hit that subscribe button and join riders who appreciate the engineering stories behind the legends. Keep the rubber side down.